Dr. Edwards, Lee Edwards, uh, has been a fixture in the conservative movement, the liberty movement, for definitely as long as I've been alive. And this is all going to sound like I'm saying he's old, and that is not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to uh, do a little bit of what people my age can do when they get a chance to be with people who were founding members, um, chroniclers, historians of, activists in, promoters of, uh, the same ideas that uh, founded uh, Acton Institute, Father Robert and Chris Marin's project. The um, reason that Dr. Edwards is special to me is the first time I ever met him, I was a brand new professor at Grove City College, and I was brought into the Philadelphia Society. Some of you certainly know what that is. And that's where I met him. And over the years, I would interact with him because my students at Patrick Henry or Grove City or somewhere would be interns at Heritage Foundation where he is and would see him. You have his biography there, and I'm, I'm going to briefly allude to it. You can read it. But as you know, I like to be a little more personal about these when I can. And so there are scores, if not hundreds easily, of people in the liberty movement that have been personally directly affected by him, as well as all of those who've indirectly been affected. And one of the ways they've been indirectly affected is that Dr. Edwards is a prolific writer, about 15 books, columns, and some of the most important publications. But especially for someone like me, a political scientist who's recovering from that and thinks that good political science is the study of history, above all, in philosophy and theology, he writes the history of many things. He wrote a history of Grove City College. He's written histories or focused on people that their historical import is uh, underpinning so much of the idea's action in the world. So he's with us today to talk about uh, a number of things, but most importantly, his latest book, Just Right, A Life in Pursuit of Liberty. And it's about him, and it's about time. Who better than him to talk about what he's done? And it is on sale in the back. He'll also sign copies. It's cheaper than on Amazon. I will not verify exactly how much cheaper, but I know if we can do anything to uh, diminish the great behemoth's control of our life, and I'm a prime member, so I do like it, uh, please buy here if you're looking for it. It is a pleasure for Acton Institute to have Dr. Lee Edwards. Please help me welcome him. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, so much of a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Paul, for that wonderful introduction. Long been an admirer of the, of the Acton Institute and its important work on the role of faith and reason in our society. And that's, I'm going to be talking about three giants of the conservative movement this afternoon who understood that and who practiced that. Now, these giants really walked the earth in the last half of the 20th century. And these giants, their names were uh, Barry Goldwater, uh, Ronald Reagan, and William F. Buckley, Jr. And what did they have in common? Well, they were certainly charismatic leaders who could inspire an audience to action. They believed that free enterprise could bring more opportunity and prosperity to more people than any other economic system. They oppose communism and every other form of tyranny over the mind of man. And they looked to a transcendent being for guidance and inspiration. They were true men of faith. For example, in his 1960 political manifesto, The Conscience of a Conservative, and by the way, if you've never had an opportunity to read that political manifesto, uh, it's only 125 pages, but it contains in it so much which we can learn from even today, even though it was written all those many years ago. In The Conscience of a Conservative, Barry Goldwater talked about the two sides of man, the economic and the spiritual. And he said that the spiritual side was the more important side. When he ran for president in 1964, Barry Goldwater insisted that every campaign rally begin with a prayer. And one of the major themes of his campaign was the need for morality and government. And he talked about that 
day after day in that campaign. And I know because I was there as his director of communications. He was not a libertarian, as some people have suggested, uh, but what we call a fusionist. A fusionist. Somebody who melded the conservative and the libertarian ideas and did it successfully. Second giant, uh, Ronald Reagan. Well, from the age of 12, Ronald Reagan was a believer and a member of the fundamentalist Christian church, also known as the Disciples of Christ, later attended the Presbyterian School uh, Church in, in Hollywood. Reagan also had a lifelong fascination with Catholicism. And I think that's due to his Irish heritage and his friendship with Catholics like Judge William Clark, who was a close friend and his national security advisor. Reagan believed from that time of when he first joined the church at the age of 12 that God has a plan for all of us. Well, one day, Judge Clark, National Security Advisor, came into the Oval Office, was briefing President Reagan, admitted that he had some bad news. There had been a setback in their campaign to defeat the Soviet Union. When Reagan said, oh, gee, that's, that's, that's too bad, Clark replied, well, it's part of the DP. And Reagan said, the DP, well, what's that? And Judge Clark said, the divine plan. Ah, said, said Reagan. About two weeks later, Judge Clark came into the Oval Office reporting as he did every day and said, I have some good news. We've had an advance in our campaign to put the Soviet Union on the defensive. Ah, said Ronald Reagan, part of the DP. And Judge Clark said, yes, it was. And so ever after that, ever after that, when these two men came together, which was frequent, and would talk about the ups and downs of foreign policy and national security, depending upon what was happening, very often Reagan would look at Judge Clark, give him a wink and say, ah, the DP. So this was sort of a little code which they had going back and forth. Following the attempted assassination of the president in March of 1981, one of the first people whom Reagan asked to see and to talk to was Terence Cardinal Cook of New York. And he said to Cardinal Cook on that occasion, quote, I have decided that whatever time I have left is for him, capital H. Whatever happens now, I owe my life to God and will try to serve him every way I can. And I wonder, is it a coincidence that the president and the cardinal met on Good Friday? When President Reagan met with Pope John Paul II a year later, he said much the same thing and it caused the pope to respond that he too had been saved for a greater purpose. And so a special bond was forged between these two men who had survived an assassin's bullet. And they worked together thereafter to help end the Cold War. In his 1984 re-election campaign, Reagan remarked, quote, what I have felt for a long time is that the people in this country were hungry for what you might call a spiritual renewal. And I always remembered that Teddy Roosevelt said this office, the office of the presidency, was a bully pulpit. And I decided that it was possible for me to help in that revival, and I wanted to do that. In his August 1992 address to the Republican National Convention, which is really his last public speech to the nation, Reagan made five references to God or Christ. And he connected his quote, God-given optimism to the metaphor of America as the shining city on a hill. And he concluded that address with these words, my fellow Americans, on behalf of myself and Nancy, goodbye. And God bless each and every one of you.
and God bless this country we love. Now that's become almost a pro forma conclusion by presidents and others, but Ronald Reagan was one of the very first, if not the first president, to make that always a part of his concluding remarks in a speech to the nation. Reagan was, in fact, a man of prayer. Uh, we know this from the wonderful research done by Paul Kengor uh, and others. He was a man of prayer who believed in the Bible, which he said, quote, contains all the answers to all the problems that face us. Now the third giant, William F. Buckley, Jr., Bill Buckley. Well, pressed for years to write a so-called Catholic book, Bill Buckley produced in 1997, Nearer My God, an Autobiography of Faith, which Bill Bennett called A Modern Pilgrim's Progress. It's filled with the opinions of friends and colleagues about Catholicism and its strengths and weaknesses, but sparse, sparse as to the details of the author's faith, except in two places. Buckley traveled to Lourdes in 1994, not to seek a miraculous cure, but to satisfy his curiosity about, quote, what exactly goes on there and what its impact might be on one first-time visitor, i.e. himself. He left Lourdes deeply moved by the faith of the thousands of malads who came hoping but not expecting a miracle and who came away, he wrote, with a sense of reconciliation, if not well-being. Our burden, he writes, is to keep the faith, whatever God's plan for us, knowing, quote, that the greatest tonic of all is divine love, which is nourished by human love, even as human love is nourished by divine love. The most personal chapter in Nearer My God is the one about the ordination of Michael Bozell, the son of his sister, Trish. The chapter is, if nothing else, I know you'll enjoy this chapter. It's prime Buckley, overflowing with descriptions of the 51 relatives and friends who traveled to that Benedictine Abbey of Solem in France for Brother Michael's ordination. The truly awful wine at the party the night before and alas, there was no miracle. A moving letter from Father Brent to son Michael and a description of the monastery with its unmistakable feel and aroma of age and piety and indomitability. Laying and lying in his snug hotel bed and thinking of that young monk in his cell rising at midnight to sing his orisons, Buckley concludes that Almost certainly, Michael was the happiest of us all and that only God can dispense such a thing as that. It so happens that in the, about the same time, in the mid-90s, I interviewed Bill Buckley for a profile in Crisis Magazine and I learned two things about the seemingly never still or silent writer, lecturer, and TV host. I asked him, well, do you have a favorite prayer? Well, he said, I pray the rosary daily. I thought to myself, well, if Bill Buckley, as busy as he is, can find time to say the rosary, so can I. And as a matter of fact, when he was buried some years later, he was buried with two things, uh, his rosary and a jar of his favorite peanut butter. When I asked him about the influence of his father and mother, both devout Catholics, he related that as a boy, his mother went through a particularly difficult pregnancy. There was talk that she or the child in her womb might even die. Uh, he prayed daily to Jesus, who's only nine years old, that his mother and sibling-to-be would survive, which they did, from which Buckley said, quote, I've had a love affair with Jesus Christ ever since. Myself, I too believe in the DP. Uh, here are just a couple of examples if I may share them with you. Um, Bill Buckley saved me from myself 
Uh, I was living in Paris uh, on the left bank, uh, trying to be the next Scott Fitzgerald or Ernest Hemingway. Failing miserably, I wrote a novel which was rejected. I wrote short stories which were rejected. I wrote poems which were rejected. And I finally came home very discouraged. So what am I going to do? Am I going to keep writing things which are rejected? Or am I going to do something else? So I said, well, I think I'll try to write a little essay about France, where I'd been living. And I said in that essay that if France did not pick a strong leader like Charles de Gaulle, it was headed for a downfall and decline. Well, Bill Buckley, whom I'd never met at that time, this is the late 50s, published that article. It was my first published article. And I said to myself, ah, the market is telling me something. So from there on, I cast off any desire to be another Hemingway, which I could never be, or Scott Fitzgerald or what have you, and concentrate on something I do pretty well, which is political writing. I wound up uh, a few years later in 1964 with the Goldwater campaign, first with the draft committee and then with the Goldwater for president committee. I was very young, uh, very inexperienced, uh, but I was there. I had known Goldwater. He had known me. I'd written about him. So I was a pretty good deputy. And they said, well, Lee, you're much too young and inexperienced, so we're going to hire a veteran. They brought in Bud Litton, God bless him who was a veteran, but unfortunately, a week later, he had a heart attack and had to resign. So they looked around, and there was Lee Edwards, but he was too young and too inexperienced. They brought another veteran in. Turned out that he was an alcoholic <laughs> and what we used to call a skirt chaser. So they fired him, and they looked around, and there was one guy standing, left standing, me. And so the campaign manager said, well, you're too young and inexperienced, but we're going to give you a chance. And so I wound up as uh, director of information for the Goldwater for President Committee, I'm sure only through divine providence. In 1969, think back to those days, the Vietnam War, uh, hot and heavy, uh, many, many people demonstrating against it. Hundreds of thousands coming to Washington, D.C. to demonstrate against the war and our servicemen in Vietnam. And a friend of mine, a colleague at George Washington University, Charles Mosier, said, you know what we need? We need to do some kind of counter event. And I said, I'll do it. So I became the coordinator pro bono uh, for a rally on Veterans Day of 1969 and working with the American Legion, the VFW, other veterans groups, and other organizations in the district and elsewhere, 25,000 people turned up at the Washington Monument for our rally. It was the largest demonstration for our servicemen ever held up to that point in Washington, D.C. We handed out, you know, these little miniature flags, American flags, you just sort of like that. We handed out 10,000 of them. And I was privileged to give the opening remarks. And I looked out at the 25,000 people and I said, ladies and gentlemen, let us show the world the real face of America. And I began waving this little miniature flag. And so 10,000 people did the same thing. There was this fluttering wave of American flags with the Washington Monument behind it. And I'm proud to say that the following week, Time Magazine put that photo on the cover, showing truly, I think, the real face of America. Let me uh, just mention one more DP in my own personal life. Think back to January 1990. It's two months since the fall of the Berlin Wall, which is a great event. And filled us with joy and that finally that terrible wall had come down, the Iron Curtain was no more, and the people of Eastern and Central Europe who had been under brutal communist oppression for 40 years were at last free. But as I sat there with my wife Anne, 
and our daughter Elizabeth, I was worried. I was, I was fretting because already I could see people were sort of forgetting about what had happened. They were forgetting about the victims. They were forgetting about the crimes of communism. And I went on and on. And finally, Anne said, you know what we need? We need a memorial to the victims of communism. And I said, what an idea. Grabbed a paper napkin, wrote on it, our ala Arthur Laffer, wrote on it, a memorial to the victims of communism. The next day, I called Lev Dobryansky, a comrade in arms from the captive nations days. And I said, let's get started on a great adventure to build this memorial. It took us 14 years. And we had to negotiate the 24 steps necessary to build a monument in Washington. 24. We went through all, all of them. We came down to number 24. And what we needed for the final step was the approval of a neighborhood commission. A neighborhood commission. We had federal commissions. They'd signed up on the design. They'd signed up on the site. And we've been raising the money through private sources. But we had to have this neighborhood commission approval. So we said, well, how do we go about that? Well, there's one key guy, Mr. Thomas. Well, where's Mr. Thomas? He's in a nursing home. Oh, my goodness. But he, he's, he's still seeing people. So our architect and I, Mary Kay and I, went calling on Mr. Thomas one Sunday afternoon. And in came Mr. Thomas, and he was African-American in a wheelchair. And we stood there. And we began talking to him. And it developed that he had marched with Martin Luther King, that he was a political ally of Marion Barry, a rather controversial mayor of Washington, D.C., that he had been born and bred in Washington, D.C. And I was thinking all of his time, ladies and gentlemen, how can I relate? What arguments can I make and give to him? And he was saying, well, how much is this going to cost? And what's the traffic? And what is this going to do for the, my, my constituents? in this area, because his particular area was this precise part uh, at Mass Avenue and New Jersey Avenue, two blocks from Union Station, and on and on and on for two and a half hours, standing there, because we were afraid to sit down. <laughs> so, and finally, after two and a half hours, Mr. Thomas looks up at us and he says, well, I just want to say one thing. I don't like communism. And I thought to myself, why didn't you say that two hours ago? <laughs> but he did say it. And then two days later, three days later, he introduced a resolution. They passed it unanimously. And we finally, on, in June of 2007, we dedicated the memorial, the first memorial, ladies and gentlemen, to all 100 million victims of communism. And President George W. Bush was there to accept it for the American people. So do I believe in the DP? Indeed, I do. Well, let me finish, if I may, with just a few observations and a sort of sharing some information about our three giants and their attitudes about free enterprise. Let me take first uh, Barry Goldwater. Again, going back to the conscience of a conservative, I recommend it to you highly. He says, we must have limited government and a balanced federal budget. Looking at specifics, he said and wrote, and by the way, the conscience of a conservative, this political manifesto published in 1960, sold 3.5 million copies. That's the most widely read political manifesto of that decade and maybe of that, of that era, 3.5 million. Echoing Milton Friedman, who was, by the way, an informal advisor uh, to, to Barry Goldwater, he declared, quote, government has a right to claim an equal percentage of each man's wealth and no more. A flat tax. He described the graduated income tax as a confiscatory tax. Eliminate programs, he said. We can't just talk about curtailing. We must eliminate programs, starting with farm subsidies. 
which is what he called for in that campaign four years later. Now, he didn't say these programs should be eliminated overnight. We should establish a timetable for a stage withdrawal, along with reducing federal spending by, he said, 10%. I think we'd be very happy if it were even 1%, right, uh, these days, to reduce spending and taxes in that order. He warned against the welfare state. It wasn't uh, not just on the basis of dollars and cents. He said the welfare state should be opposed because it eliminates any feeling of responsibility by the recipient for his own welfare and that of his family and neighbors. Does that sound familiar? Well, let's see, that was the argument of Charles Murray and Losing Ground, published some 20 years later. He restated a fundamental conservative truth about the material and spiritual sides of man are intertwined. If we take from someone the personal responsibility for caring for his material needs, we take from him also the will an opportunity to be free. I think somebody's holding up a red card in the back there. I can't read it. What does it say? Oh, my goodness. Well, I probably will take 10, uh, if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, Ronald Reagan applied conservative principles as president. Remember back in 1981, the marginal tax rate maximum was 70 percent, 70 percent. Back when he was acting in Hollywood, it was 91 percent back in the 1940s and the 1950s. So Reagan insisted that we had to reduce those kind of taxes because people will be more industrious, they'll have more incentive to work hard, money they earn will add fuel to the great economic machine that energizes our national progress. If you look back on the 80s, some people call it the, the decade of greed. It was the decade of progress. 17 million new jobs, unemployment down from 9.7 to 5%. The stock market doubled. Federal revenues, but they'll keep saying that, well, if you cut taxes, federal revenues will dive. Not true, not true. In the Reagan years, federal revenues increased from 618 billion a year to 909 billion a year. And the federal debt as a percent of the GDP went from 6.3% to 2.9%. Bill Buckley. Many things can be said about, about Bill. Uh, and he was actually majored in economics at Yale and wrote extensively about that uh, when he was the editor of the Yale Daily News. Um, and here's what he said might be a way of addressing this problem of educating young people. Have you all heard about this recent poll taken of millennials in which 50% said they would rather live under socialism than capitalism? 50%. So the educational job, which needs to be done and is being done by Acton and by other groups. Now here's what Bill Buckley suggested. Let us establish Adam Smith chairs of political and economic philosophy at various colleges, including Yale, in which the adherents of free enterprise could present the arguments for the system that has made America the world's most prosperous and freest nation. Finally, a point about Bill Buckley. He recognized supply side before there was supply side. It's true. In 1971, you could see the nascent beginnings of supply side and talked about it editorially and but even went beyond that and hired a young economist named Alan Reynolds to come and work for National Review. National Review was the first journal of opinion in America to have a reporter who concentrated on supply side economics before there was even such a thing. How, for how fortunate then we were and are to have such giants as Bill Buckley, Ronald Reagan, and Barry Goldwater. It remains for us, it remains for us to be faithful to the foundation they laid down, a foundation of faith 
and free enterprise, which ensures that America will remain a shining city on a hill. Thank you all very much. I hope I didn't go over too far. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. We now have about 30 minutes for Q&A. Please raise your hand. We have mics on both sides, and we will get to your questions as soon as possible. Thanks. Hi, Lee. It's Sam Tannenhaus, <clears throat> who's also writing about Bill Buckley. And I wonder if you could tell the audience a little bit about Brent Bozell's role in the writing of The Conscience of a Conservative. <clears throat> Wonderful to see you, Sam. Looking forward to that book. When's it coming out? <laughs> um, there have always been ghost writers for politicians. Uh, George Washington had a pretty fair one named Alexander Hamilton. And one of the exceptions would be Abraham Lincoln. And for the young people in the audience, please, please study Abraham Lincoln's writing, if you're interested in being a writer. Fantastic. Uh, FDR had ghost writers. Uh, Dwight David Eisenhower, ghost writers. Richard Nixon, not so much. Ronald Reagan, not so much, except when he got into the second term and some other places like that, did a lot of his own writing. Barry Goldwater was approached about doing a little pamphlet on Americanism. This is 1960. And he said, well, I'm not really a writer. And they said, well, what about Brent Bozell? Brent Bozell, who was the, uh, the roommate of Bill Buckley at Yale and who married Bill Buckley's sister, Trish, which I've already mentioned, uh, was a speechwriter for Barry Goldwater. So it was very logical to go to, to Brett, who knew Goldwater's mind on so many things. And together, together, they collaborated on the conscience of a conservative, which certainly has the accents of a trained a philosophical mind like Brent Bozell, but also has the political directness of a Barry Goldwater in which he says, let's do away with farm subsidies, let's have a flat tax, Let's have a voluntary option for Social Security, and on and on and on. So it was an extraordinary collaboration between these two men, Barry Goldwater and Brent Bozell. As I mentioned, 3.5 million copies were sold. Um, ever after, uh, Buckley and, uh, uh, rather, Bozell and uh, Goldwater would run into each other, and they'd say, well, have you gotten your royalty check lately? <laughs> So there was never quite sure what kind of an accounting was done uh, for those 3.5 million copies. But the impact of conscience of a conservative was extraordinary. You quoted somebody as saying that a person is depending on welfare to his own detriment. Of course, in the Bible, if you'll read a quote that says, a man that does not provide for his family, and especially his close family, is worse than a retrobate, that is a worse than a pagan. So he was actually quoting from the Bible. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, and I think that goes back to what Ronald Reagan said about the Bible in which, you know, the, the answer to our problems are there if we look for them, if we know where to look. So thank you, sir. Please. You mentioned at the top of your speech um, that Barry Goldwater was not a libertarian. I, I have in my mind's eye uh, Barry Goldwater uh, as a libertarian, and, and I remember that fondly. But I wonder if you would uh, just talk a little bit more about why you would consider him not a libertarian. be happy to. Um, but there were two Barry Goldwaters. There was a Barry Goldwater as a U.S. Senator, and but more to the point, there was a Barry Goldwater as a presidential candidate. And when he ran for the presidency in 1964, he was a fusionist, as I mentioned, demanding 
uh, that there be prayer to begin every single rally and the open acknowledgement of, of God as somebody whom he believed in. Uh, his call for morality and government, no libertarian, no libertarian is going to go around saying we must have morality and government. But Barry Goldwater did in 1964. If you go back to 1960 in the conscience of a conservative and his political manifesto, when he talked about the spiritual side being more important than the economic side, no libertarian would say that. Goldwater the libertarian emerged later in life, particularly when he left the Senate and then took positions which were definitely libertarian. But when he was on the line as a presidential candidate, he was a fusionist combining the libertarian and the traditional conservative. Um, I, I don't know uh, much about Goldwater in this regard, but Buckley and uh, Reagan both had very active and vibrant friendships with people across the aisle, with uh, people who are not ideological allies. What was it about their character that allowed for this, and what is it about contemporary conservatives that seems not to allow for that? Well, I'm, I'm going to use again this word, uh, fusionist, uh, that Buckley was a, a fusionist, uh, bringing together, as he did on the mass set of National Review, traditional conservatives, libertarians, and anti-communists, and blending them in a very effective intellectual movement, which under Ronald Reagan became a political movement. Reagan also was a fusionist, you know, re appealing to what we call the Reagan Democrats, uh, and successfully doing so. There was an instinct at that time to reach out to the other side and to believe in that fusionism could solve many of our problems. What has happened in today's political world, in my opinion, is that we've become exceedingly ideological, and that to me means rigidity. It means an unwillingness, or I should say a willingness, to believe only in yourself that you have the right answer for all problems and not to bend. After all, in my opinion, politics is the, uh, is the art of the possible. Uh, Reagan understood that. And his rule was, for example, what he called the 70% rule. They, he would take 70% of what he wanted and then come back for the other 30% later, which is what he did with the, his uh, tax reform plan of 81 and then the one in 86. Today, it's my impression that many of our political leaders are 100 percenters. They're saying, I want 100% and I want it now. It's just not realistic. And uh, I'm hopeful that uh, one of these days they'll stop beating their head against the wall and be a little more willing to practice, not a question of surrender, but to take something now with the idea that you'll come back for the other part later. I can see you thinking about that answer. Hmm. Give it some consideration. If you could choose um, three contemporaries or, or, or perhaps less worthy to wear the, the mantle of these three gentlemen, could you, could you uh, choose some, some uh, current folks who you think would be worthy to carry their, to carry their mantle? Well, if you, if you consider that uh, Buckley was what I call a popularizer and that uh, Reagan and Goldwater were politicians, so you've got two different kinds of professions and interests there. But I would say among the politicians, um, I like our vice president very much, and I think we'll be hearing more about uh, Mr. Pence in the years to come. Uh, some of our governors are very good. I just recently... Uh, heard about and was listening to uh, the governor of Nebraska, uh, who I think was making a lot of good common sense. Um, I think uh, Nikki Haley uh, is doing a, a really a good job up there at uh, the, the United Nations. Uh, there are a number of congressmen uh, that uh, are, are very promising uh, as well, Mark Meadows um, and others as well. Even uh, 
No, I, I don't think I'd, I'd go on. I'll just leave it at that. There are members of Congress, um, Mike Lee Senate, in the Senate, uh, who are smart, who are principled, uh, varying degrees of charisma. Uh, and I think as we t work our way through the crisis right now that we're confronted, uh, that those kinds of leaders are going to come to the top. I think if you compare that with what the progressives have, uh, I feel sorry for them because they're all in their 70s or near 80s and they're all just mouthing old bromides. And if I were a young progressive, I'd say, maybe I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> if I have to look to Joe Biden as the, the leader of my movement, oh, come on. I, I love, gosh, for heaven's sake. Yes, um, I had a question with reference to uh, the, the kind of monolithic result when we have such ideological divide. And monolithic uh, social contracts lead to totalitarianism in my reading of the long view of history. Would you care to comment on whether there's any similarities between what I've tried to briefly explain as a monolithic political social class and what people commonly refer to as elites, which I think is a misnomer. Thank you. Well, ide ide ideology um, is, the, is the enemy as far as I'm concerned, and I'm, I'm a Russell Kirk traditionalist, and I reject ideology because it is rigid, because it is monolithic, because it is arrogant and thinks it has all the answers. Uh, so I believe that uh, we should be willing uh, to listen to the other side. We should be willing to try to persuade them to take our position and not to demand that they do so and to reject them if they don't agree with us. Uh, in past decades, uh, and I've lived in Washington, D.C. my whole life, since I was two and a half, uh, there were moderates in both parties, and I don't think uh, necessarily that we should condemn moderates uh, to, to the, the outer darkness that because there were moderates in both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, people were willing to listen to each other. People were willing to even compromise a little bit on, on a particular issue. And again, I'm saying that compromise is, does not mean surrender, okay? Uh, if you're willing to take that 70% now and come back for the other 30 later, I think Reagan had it right. Now, you don't want to accept 20%. <laughs> or 30% and, and then try to get the other 70 later, you've got to fight for that first big chunk of what you believe in. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, our, our task of, of discussion and debate and coming together in what I call fusionism is so difficult these days because of the social media. Now, there are great many blessings which come with the social media, but because of it, the, the news media are driven uh, to this 24-7 instant analysis and instant demands, which I think has brought about some, some very uh, unfortunate uh, results, particularly in trying to get through good legislation and necessary legislation in the Congress. Hello, Lee. This is Annette Kirk. And I'm wondering what we should do about Russia. You know a lot about communism, past and present. What, how should we deal with Putin? Well, I think the same way that Reagan dealt with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. Trust but verify. And uh, that's a Russian saying. And Reagan would throw it up to Gorbachev, who would just go like this. You always say that. Why do you say that? He says, well, I, you know, I just think trust but verify. So you can sit down and talk with Putin, but you've got to make sure that he follows through on what he says he's going to do. 
and what it remains to be seen, what's going to happen. Now, if you talk to people in Poland, as I do, or Hungary, or the Baltics in particular, they are very, very concerned about Mr. Putin and how he's going to use his power, because he is uh, an authoritarian in some respects, not quite a totalitarian, but certainly an authoritarian, and they're nervous about that. Uh, so they look to the United States to exert leadership. So whatever we do as a nation, the United States, in our relations with Russia, we're not dealing in isolation. We must keep in mind how this affects our friends and allies, particularly in Eastern and Central Europe and in the Baltic states. And always trust a little, but verify a lot. Maybe I'll modify it that way. Um, as one of the younger people here, uh, Barry Goldwater is kind of more of just a footnote in our history books um, when we have that class. Uh, and I was wondering if you could explain, because you worked with him, what exactly led to his loss on like Ronald Reagan? I know there's the controversial uh, um, ad that LBJ put out with like the nuclear bomb um, and the little girl. Right. I think, was it the Daisy? Right, um, the Daisy commercial. Yep. Um, but he's really just been said, or it's been... Cons um, said that he was like a, uh, a warmonger, or people were concerned Barry Goldwater's gonna destroy the world or something like that. Right, right, yeah. Well, they said that Barry, if, you, if you vote for Barry Goldwater, you will get the United States into a war. And so those who voted for Goldwater said, well, you're right, I did vote for Barry Goldwater, and we did get into a war, except it wasn't he who did it, it was Lyndon Baines Johnson. Barry Goldwater was an extraordinary politician. Uh, I was up close to him for a year and a half. And he raised the conservative banner. And he said, I will offer a choice, conservative choice, and not an echo, a liberal echo. Now, he ran for president in 1964 knowing that he could not win, almost to a certainty. We did a poll in January of 1964, Goldwater versus Johnson. Johnson had 80%, and we had 20%. So almost, I mean, how do you make that up? I mean, it's, it's almost impossible. And as a matter of fact, the senator once said to me, he said, well, I know I'm going to lose this election, but I'm going to lose it my way. And what he meant by that was he was going to raise certain issues, which had never been raised before so-called third rail issues, like Social Security, like a flat tax, like doing away with farm subsidies, like victory over communism. Not a tie, not accommodation, not detente, but victory. Now, that was 1964, took a few years, but in 1980, when Ronald Reagan ran, you could see that he was running on many of those same issues, beginning with the most important one of all, almost, and that is victory in the Cold War taking on the Soviet Union head to head. Uh, Barry Gold, now Ronald Reagan, whom I also got to know pretty well, I first met him in 1965, I wrote the first biography of Ronald Reagan in 1967, I interviewed him for the next 20 years. Reagan would not have run in 1964. There was, there was just that much of realism and pragmatism in Reagan that he would say, well, if I, I'm not going to run if I know I can't win. Whereas Barry Goldwater was so taken with the possibilities of raising these issues and because so many young people, like myself, had urged him to run, he was willing to accede to that call and to do so. Very unusual politician, direct, blunt, very much like Arizona, you know, straight shooter. Very much straight talk guy. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, you haven't mentioned President Trump, and I was oh, just I'm so like, relieved uh, that, that finally a Trump question. I oh, would like a okay. few words on President Trump. Thank you. <laughs> well. As you might imagine, I've, I've gotten this question before. 
<clears throat> so so I'll, I'll give you a couple of things. I tell this to, to my friends as, as well as to just people whom I've just met like you all. Um, approach Trump on two tracks. One track is what he's doing, the accomplishments. Things like Justice Gorsuch, the appellate judges whom he's appointing right now, and he's driving the progressives crazy because they're all originalists. And they can see what's going on. They're trying to stop it, but they're not going to be able because we still have a majority in, in, the, uh, in the Senate. The deregulation, which is going on under him, taking various executive decisions uh, by Mr. Obama and throwing them out, canceling them out by executive action. Taking a strong stand for a tough, uh, resilient military and arm, armed forces. Demanding that it not be free, that, that free trade is not open trade, but only to the other side, but to both sides. Um, his willingness to look at a problem and try to come up with a solution. The other track, of course, is the tweet track. Yeah. And I say, don't pay that much attention to it. Don't fall into the trap of saying, oh, there he goes again, and, and of course the media are whipping it up, whipping it up, and whipping it up. That's not the most important thing about him. You might also ask yourself, well, why is he doing all the tweets? And I thought about that. I think, well, I think it's a, it's a political reason that 61 million people, I think that was the figure, 61 million people voted for him. That's a fair number of people. And I think those tweets are being sent by him to them to reassure them that, I'm, that I, Donald Trump, am still here. I'm still trying to do what I said I would do. So that's the two tracks. The other thing I would say about him is that he, in some sense, is smarter than a lot of other political leaders in Washington, D.C. In what way? I think you can draw a direct line, a direct populist line, a direct grassroots line from Barry Goldwater in 1964 and the draft movement of which I was a part from the grassroots forcing him to run in 1964 to the moral majority in 1980, which helped to elect Ronald Reagan, to the contract with America in 1994, which Newt Gingrich made sure that the grassroots were supporting all 10 items of the contract with America, to the Tea Party in 2009 and 2010, and it was Mr. Trump in 2016, just last year, who saw that same line and reached out to that populist element, which has always been there, not only in America, but also in the conservative movement. And it's a bit of, bit of a political genius that he was able to see that and result in, in his victory, his narrow victory. We have time for one more short question. One more. What about I have, if I have a long answer, what do I do to have? <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> Where do you see uh, presidential elections going in the future? Obviously, it costs a gazillion dollars to run for president, and it's a super long cycle. Yeah. And there's a lot yeah. of things that kind of bar entry. How do you see it? Uh, well, you know, I, 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 think, I think I'd love to have a debate about that. I'd love to have a debate. I'd like to have, for example, does the British model have any. any application to us and they, they deliberately limit their elections for parliament to uh, I think it's what six weeks eight weeks something like that um, I think also that the idea of encouraging all of the the networks to provide free advertising to the major candidates uh, there's so much you know negative advertising going on which I think would be diminished if we persuaded, shall we say, persuade, I don't want to have the government doing it, but persuade them to provide free time, free air time, uh, all of them, to them. Uh, I think that, but I would not want to see it done in such a way that the government is dictating how we should modify our, our electoral system. I think the, the electoral college should stand. 
I think it's an important check and balance so we don't have direct democracy. And then the founders are pretty doggone smart when they came up with that. So, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for listening. Really have enjoyed so much listening and talking with you all. And I think Acton is so important. And for those of you who are supporters out there, keep writing big checks to the Acton Institute. <laughs>